Hello and welcome to Stringham Real Estate Edge. Our guest today is Garrett Lawson, Managing Director of Forbes m and Group. Garrett, thank you for joining us today. Happy to, Gary. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Tell us, tell us about Forbes and what what does Forbes do? You, you're not part of the uh, of the magazine group, right? No, just kind of a happy coincidence that uh, Bob Forbes, who founded and, and is the president of the Forbes M and A Group, shares that name with with Steve Forbes, but not uh, not related. Mm-hmm. Um, the Forbes M and A Group is a is a boutique investment bank and uh, headquartered in Denver. We have offices here in Salt Lake City as well as in Nashville, and we are an um, investment bank that works with entrepreneurial and family-owned businesses, primarily helping them sell when they're ready to sell, either a full or partial sell, and we also help those companies raise capital when they need to. I see. Well, Garrett, I know you've been in the m and business quite some time. How long have you been with Forbes? I joined Forbes just under three years ago as they uh, wanted to open an office here in Utah. And so was introduced to them. And so I've been with them just about three years. I see. And this is their first out-of-state office? It is, yeah. And how did you get into the M&A business? I got into the M&A business in the late 90s. Uh, I had been working for a consulting company that required a, a lot of travel. And I got tired of that after a number of years and so joined an old family friend who did uh, mergers and acquisitions and uh, have been doing that since then and, and absolutely love it. Uh, can you give us an idea of the size of the market in the United States and then also here in in uh, Utah? Sure. it's Just you know, round numbers. It's a little difficult. Um, I think they estimate that there are about 32 million small businesses in the United States and because of the nature of a business transaction, um, it often isn't announced publicly mm-hmm. if it's privately held. And so it's hard to really know how many of those change hands every year. I think that nationally, um, uh, Biz by Sell, which is a, a website that aggregates um, business transactions, estimated about 7,700 of transactions in 2020, which was down from about 9,600 the year before um, because of the effects of the pandemic. Um, But those are only the ones that are reported, and there are probably many more that change hands, but there isn't a good um, data source to estimate exactly how Mm -hmm. many businesses sell in any given year. And how about Utah? The same kind of of lack of of information? Very hard to to determine. Uh, Oftentimes when a business sales, there is not a public announcement. Uh, they don't make the terms of those sales uh, public, and so very hard to estimate sure. that. Are, are there other M&A companies or business brokers here in the Salt Lake area? There that are. Or would, in effect, be competitors? Yes, and, and um, uh, I, I think it's, it's probably good to distinguish between what um, a general business brokerage might do and what uh, a, a, an investment bank uh, might do. And, and um, primarily with the sale of businesses that might sell for less than $10 million, you would likely have a business broker who um, would be involved in that transaction. Transactions that are larger than that um, would generally be um, handled by an investment bank. And mm-hmm. so uh, within the state of Utah, there are a number of uh, business brokerages, some of whom are associated with uh, commercial real estate companies who uh, have a group who may focus on the sale of businesses uh, along with, with real property. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you do both? Do you do M&A as well as business brokerage? Um now we focus exclusively on transactions that would be m- most often larger than what a business broker might work on. Okay. And what sort of licensing is required for you and or your, your company? Uh, we're licensed um, uh, uh, through the SEC. Uh, so okay. we have securities licenses that... Um, Which would allow you to sell stock. Which allow us to sell stock. It okay. allows us to to raise capital, uh, to sell minority positions in a company, mm-hmm. and um, that could be in the midst uh, of, of changing. But uh, but right now, those kinds of transactions require being securities licensed uh, in the state of Utah to sell a small business. If you're selling the assets of that business, 
uh, unless something has changed over the last couple of years, there's not any kind of particular licensing required okay. unless there is some form of, of real estate that might be involved. And, and, and that can happen fairly often, um, even if the sale of the business does not include the sale of the facility, uh, you oftentimes are assigning the lease that the business um, has signed sure. with that building. And if you're assigning that leasehold interest, that does require um, a, a real estate license. And so while the sale of the business does not uh, uh, necessarily require it, oftentimes because of the other features, uh, you, you do need to be licensed. Uh, to so do so you, you, you do have to have a real estate license here in, you personally, here in Utah? Um, I, I do have a, a, a real estate license here in Utah. With a securities license, um, you, you may not need it as... Sure, uh, as I understand. You right. As you said, generally there is real estate in some form, whether it's, it's actual building and land or a, a lease. Right. And, and again, just kind of confirm, right. that necessitates the requirement of having a license a real estate license. That's correct. Do you represent the buy side or the sell side or both sides? Um, my um, my firm now primarily represents the sell side, and I historically have have um, have represented the sellers. There are times when uh, we would do some buy side representation, but, mm -hmm. but primarily um, the sell side, and there are a number of reasons for that. Sure. But, um, there certainly isn't any licensing or any real difference between that. It's really a, a function of um, of, a, of a choice of, sure. of where to. Sure, that's just the choice of, of your your company, and so other M and A or business brokers may have the opposite approach. They may prefer to represent the the buy side. That's just an individual business decision. That's right. Yeah, that's right. How do you go about finding companies that are interested in selling? It seems like that's sort of a, sort of a confidential. You wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily want to let that information out publicly for obvious yeah. reasons. Yeah, it's a great point, and I think because of that, uh, most of my clients come to me through referrals, and those referrals are usually through their trusted advisors. Mm -hmm. um, these are their accountants, their attorneys, their financial and wealth advisors. Um, sure business consultants, uh, people with whom they have an established relationship, whom they trust, and would be the first individuals that they might talk to when they're considering the sale of their business. And since generally those professionals aren't involved in, in brokering those transactions, they then reach out to a business broker or an M&A professional to represent, the, represent their clients. And so most of uh, my clients come from referrals from these kinds of individuals from my previous clients. Um, there are times, however, when we may target certain industries and then we would do uh, direct uh, marketing to business owners that fit certain criteria based on size and geography and, and industry. Mm -hmm. uh, but more often than not, they, the, they come through referrals. Sure. I'm kind of curious, how or why did Forbes M&A Group decide to come to Utah as their first venture? Obviously, that's where you were. That's mm -hmm. where your, your expertise is. But uh, was that the, the primary motive or what were some of the other considerations in making that decision? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think um, one of the initial um, reasons was that the folks at Forbes wanted to make their first entry outside of Colorado uh, in a in a geographically uh, close uh, state. And mm -hmm. so they considered a number of different markets all within, say, an hour to two flight from Denver, uh, obviously Salt Lake being one of them. But they looked at other markets. And I think as they began to look at those markets, they began to see that I think that Salt Lake and Utah in, in general have been underserved in terms of uh, investment bank uh, here. And I think that's because historically just the size of this market has been smaller and it hasn't warranted um, some of the larger banks setting up offices. And so when they would handle transactions, they would just fly in from the coast. And sure. so um, I think Utah, Salt Lake in particular, has been 
uh, while there are some other investment banks in town, have been historically underserved. And given the growth of the market, the the strong entrepreneurial spirit here, the market is maturing and, and warranted um, that. And so it seemed like a great sure. uh, opportunity. Just a natural extension, of, of course. Very it similar cultures and, and business environments to, to Colorado as well. So, Is there a lot of competition here in town? Uh, you know offhand, how many other companies like yours are operating in or around Salt Lake? Yeah, I would say there are probably four or five others. Oh, really? Not, yep. not many? Then. Not very many, no. Let's assume that a company decides they're going to sell and they're given Garrett Lawson's name. Call you up and say, Garrett, I'm ready to sell. What do you do from that point? The first thing we do is we um, under, try to understand their, uh, their goals and their company to... Um, make sure that what they're looking to accomplish is something that we feel like is attainable and realistic mm -hmm. and that it's something that uh, we focus on. And so we ask a lot of questions uh, primarily and understand their company, uh, what stage their company's in, how it's doing, understand the goals of the, of the owner, and try to get a good understanding so that we can determine whether we're a good fit. And, um, and then we move to more detailed um, investigation into the company to understand its financial and operational profile uh, because um, and that is really in order to give the owner some sense of what we believe the value of the company might be in the marketplace um, and so that requires uh, going through the financials doing some analysis doing mm -hmm. some valuation work and important to understand uh, our clients' goals and their valuation expectations as it relates to what their business may be worth in the marketplace mm -hmm. to make sure that we think it's a, a achievable. Uh, roughly, how long would it take you to complete that due diligence? Is it just a matter of hours or is it a matter of days or weeks? It's, or? it's typically um, a matter of days and maybe a couple weeks, again, depending on uh, how organized and available the, the financials and the other information mm -hmm. we need to do that. Uh, if that's readily available, that can be done in, in, a, in a matter of days. Oftentimes it takes a little work potentially with their account, uh, accounting uh, function to get those in the kind mm -hmm. of shape that we need. Uh, once, you, once you've decided that that's a, a client you're willing to take on, they have decided that they're committed to selling and that you're the, the company to do that, then what's the next step? I, I presume a, a listing agreement, a contract is... Is yeah, agreed to? an engagement agreement or a listing agreement uh, is, is put in place, and that outlines the length, the, the fees involved, the kind of process that we'll go through. Once that agreement is in place, then we begin preparing the kinds of materials that we need to go to the market, uh, looking at who are the potential buyers in, 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 out there. Are they within the industry? Are they private equity or other financial kinds of institutions that, that specialize in buying sure. businesses. And we prepare a confidential information memorandum, which is a document that once uh, a buyer expresses interest confidentially and has signed a non-disclosure agreement, we will give them that, that outlines the basics about, uh, about the business. And so all of those materials have to be prepared before you go out and, and uh, approach the market. It sounds like that's a real challenge. On, on one hand, you have to respect confidentiality. Uh, on the other hand, it's not like you can just put a, an ad in the paper or on the Internet saying ABC business is for sale. So how do you go about identifying potential buyers to even start that discussion? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. And, and you're right, it, it really is a, a fine line between giving enough information about a business opportunity so that someone can identify that as being something they're interested in and giving too much that they can then identify which particular business you're talking about. And business owners um, generally are not interested in having their customers and their competitors and their of employees course. understand they're thinking about that. And so it is, um, it is difficult. There are a number of different ways. That I, I think the primary way is the creation of uh, what is essentially a blind executive summary, uh, a, a one-page document that's often called a teaser. And it has generic 
information about the, the business, and and that can be, um, you know, a, a, a location within a state or within the United States without being too specific. Uh, some general description, some, some high-level financial information, that document then is provided to parties who might have an interest. And if based on that information, um, they still seem interested and they can demonstrate that they have an, uh, the available capital to do mm -hmm. a transaction of that size, then we have them sign a non-disclosure agreement, which then uh, prevents them from sharing any information that we give them sure. about the business to anyone who, who is not involved in their decision-making process. So I, it sounds as though you have identified potential buyers which you will approach versus them coming to you. So that, I guess, assumes that you have done a some type of due diligence mm -hmm. or review of this company or individual mm -hmm. to confirm that they have the, the wherewithal to make a purchase or investment of this nature. Uh, that, that's true. That, and, that and has to be kind of, kind of challenging at times, isn't it? To, it uh, is. And, and, and the larger my clients are, um, the easier it is to identify those prospective purchasers. Oftentimes on the sale of a small business, it isn't possible to necessarily identify all the potential acquirers because oftentimes it's another individual that will be buying their business. Mm -hmm. And in that instance, there is another way to advertise that possibility, that, that, that opportunity. And that's typically done through um, various um, what we call deal aggregators, which are essentially websites that you can pay to um, put your business listing on that then uh, if someone is interested in buying a business, they can go to this website and search the data by industry and by size and mm -hmm. by geography, and then they would find uh, you, uh, and then you would go through that same process. Sure. Uh, if you're selling a larger business, oftentimes um, it's easier to identify who the prospective buyers are, and then you're able to reach out to them rather than, than them finding you. I see. Do you specifically look for in-state buyers, or are you willing to go wherever the wherever the market is? Yeah, uh, no, I, I think that 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 it's important really to um, to not only hit potential buyers within the state, but to uh, have access to, to buyers certainly at a, at a national, regional, and national level, and and then. Um, oftentimes international. Uh, I think that in particular Utah is a state that more and more is, um, is desirable as a place to live and, and, uh, and operate a business in. It's a very business friendly environment compared to other states on the coast. And so more and more outside companies and outside individuals are looking to Utah as a place to, uh, to buy and operate a business in and move their families mm -hmm. here. And so it's important to be able to, uh, if you have a Utah-based client for sale, to be able to expose them to folks outside the state. Sure. You indicated that there are essentially two options. Either you sell stock of the company or you sell the assets. Which is which do you prefer, stock or, or assets? Yeah, it, it, there, it's, a, it's a complex question, and it's a good question. And so I'm not sure I can give you a definitive answer in the amount of time we have, but generally speaking, uh, the seller uh, of a business would prefer to sell the stock of that business because they receive a more favorable tax treatment on the sale of the on those sale proceeds. The buyers, however, prefer just the opposite. They receive ah. uh, a more favorable tax treatment if they buy the assets of a company because they're able to get a step up in their basis based on the purchase price of those assets rather than the current book value mm -hmm. uh, that, that the seller uh, would have. And so there is a negotiation in almost every instance uh, between the buyer and the seller on that, fa on that feature. And so um, I, I would say that more often than they're not, um, and there are some legal reasons as well as why the buyer would prefer mm -hmm. to buy assets. And so I would say more often than not, this, those transactions happen as an asset sale. Um, is that simply because it's easier? It's less less costly. It, it it isn't necessarily less costly in terms of doing a transaction, but um, um, 
because of the reasons that buyers prefer to do asset sales, um, generally that's what happens. And so oftentimes, if it's a stock sale, it may be because the seller has contracts in place that would be hard to assign if someone didn't buy that entity. Um, And so while it, it, a meaningfully amount of time a stock sale does happen, mm-hmm. I would say the majority of those instances are asset sales. What kind of industries do you deal with generally? Um, I have been, I, th- I think what you would call a generalist in my career, meaning that I, I, I work in lots of different kinds mm-hmm. of industries. Um, but I would say that um, over the last number of years, um, I've had a focus on um, consumer good uh, goods and, and products, as well as business services, mm-hmm. uh, business to business services, particularly particularly those that uh, have a technology component, whether it's a software as a service or a technology enabled service provider. Do you have a personal preference? Any particular industry that that you you really like for one reason or another? No, you, you know I don't, and I think that's one of the reasons why I've tended to. Uh, to work in all industries throughout my career is I really enjoy that aspect of uh, getting to learn uh, something new about mm-hmm. an industry, about companies that I maybe had not ever heard of before or considered. And so I really enjoy that uh, that part of the uh, 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 of my practice. Um, but there are certainly folks who do love to specialize and they will pick an industry that they love. I, I tend to like the the challenge of learning new industries. Sure. Do you do, do you do deals outside the state, or do you concentrate strictly within Utah? No. In fact, the majority of the transactions that I'm involved with are with clients who are located outside of the state. Uh, I think um, Utah is still a relatively small market compared to um, other states, and uh, these days ge- geography does not have a, a huge. Uh, role in, in determining whether you can effectively represent a company. And so many of my clients are located outside of the state mm-hmm. of Utah. When a company comes to you, do they have a predetermined idea as to what they want to list the company for? In other words, the selling price is X. Um, or do the they question, and I would advice? say, I would say it really varies. I think there oftentimes a business owner will have gotten some idea about what the value might be. Either he's heard about a transaction in his industry or her industry that that led them to believe to their certain sure. value, or, or yeah. perhaps they've had their CPA or someone else do some kind of valuation. And so I would say, you know, maybe 50% of the time my clients have some sense about what they think the, the business is worth. Uh, oftentimes that's that's not accurate. Oftentimes, um, they might undervalue ask. it. They might overvalue sure. it. There are a lot of different ways to think about it. Um, I, I was just going to ask how, how how realistic in in most cases, in most situations, I would think that there's a certain pride of ownership, yeah. particularly if we've been involved with a business for 10, 15, 20 years. We've got more than just a financial investment in it, and of course, we want to maximize on on that return, but sometimes there's an emotional aspect of it. Is that does that present a challenge? Uh, yeah, you're exactly right. I think more often than not, business owners think their businesses are worth more than they are, uh-huh. and then that is because of they often time have put you know that often represents their life's work, and and there is an emotional tie, and they have. Um, you know, taking a nice living from it. And, and so sure. there is this natural tendency to think it's more valuable than it is. But um, I think um, ultimately um, when you buy a business, it, it's it's about the return that you'll get on that. And of course. And, uh, and so that tends to, to rationalize the values as, as you need to get a certain amount of return on your investment. Without getting too technical, how would you go about recommending or calculating what you perceive to be a realistic price for a property or for a business? Generally speaking, it is, um, it's based on the net cash flows that are available to a new owner. Okay. And so Makes sense. one of the important first steps is to look at the income statement uh, of of a potential client to really understand how profitable it is. What are the true net cash flows that can be made available to the buyer? Mm-hmm. 
and then um, you you put um, you look at the kind of return that a buyer will expect uh, on their investment based on the risk involved in buying that that particular company, and um, and some companies are inherently more risky than other companies, and so the rate of return that a buyer would look for in there is going to be higher, and so it's worth a little less as a as a function of its of its cash flow. So it's very dependent on a lot of different factors, but the beginning. Um, step is to really look at those net cash flows. Mm -hmm. And then the industry generally talks about valuation as some multiple of those cash flows. I see. Um, And so you can kind of reduce it to some multiple of those cash flows, but it's really a function of the amount of return that the the buying market will expect on that asset. Do most companies sell for cash or is financing a big issue in most transactions? Good question. I I would say that particularly with smaller businesses, uh, the lion's share of those transactions have some form of... um, of consideration other than cash that the seller receives. Mm-hmm. And there are a number of reasons f- for that. Um, you know, and, and unlike uh, a real estate transaction, which often always, tra- which, which often transact for cash to the seller, they, yes. they may go to a bank and borrow money, but the cat, the seller receives cash in the sale of a small business. Uh, you may have some percentage of that, uh, that the seller receives in a note that they're providing to so the seller, buyer. seller carry back. seller carry back. Do you get involved in assisting the buyer coming up with, with capital with uh, financing a, a business? Uh, more limited, probably just to the extent of uh, potentially re- referring lending sources to them, whether that's a bank who works with the SBA, who is one of the primary lenders on, on, on business transactions. Um, generally speaking, um, other than that, in, in providing them the information they need to go to the bank, uh, we don't get that involved mm-hmm. in the buyer's uh, financing. Uh. Well, we have time for, for a couple more questions. Uh, the first one is, how has technology changed your business over the last few years? Technology's had a, a, a big um, role in, in my business, and it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. And, um, and that... Um, you know, one, one obvious way is that as a buyer is really doing their thorough due diligence about uh, my clients, in the past, you had to set up a physical room where you have all of the printed uh, materials that mm-hmm. they would come and, and spend hours at, going through sure. those. Now there are virtual data rooms where the documents are uploaded and buyers can just access them online. And so that's been something that's, that's happened over the last 10 or 15 years. But also there are more and more uh, service providers out there that allow information about a client to be shared with the marketplace um, in ways that it never could before. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, it streamlines the process. It makes the opportunities available to, to more uh, eyes, or, or, uh, eyes of buyers, both nationally and, and internationally, and so um, technology continues to have a, a big role. What's the most unusual business you've ever been asked to sell? You know, it's a good question. I would say one of them uh, was a business that I sold a number of years ago that um, was a, a a pet cremation business, and so really uh, someone that is someone's pet dies. And um, they would work with the veterinarians who generally are, are, are the first sure. line of those. And then they would help dispose of those, those uh, obviously, of those pets. And, and while it seems a, a, a grisly and maybe unsavory business, it's very necessary service. And um, successfully sold it? Very successfully sold it. It's a very strong, very profitable industry. Interesting. And I think it's, it's often those unsexy businesses that are the most interesting and most profitable. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes when you think about selling a business, people think of obvious uh, businesses and and oftentimes they aren't as profitable and and ultimately as desirable as businesses that you may have never considered. And so uh, those kinds of businesses that fill a very distinct niche uh, are interesting and and they're unusual, but they can be great businesses to own. Uh, ask you to put your uh, your forecasting hat on for a minute. What do you see uh, 2021 being? Good year, mediocre year, 
or extremely strong year? I think it's going to be somewhere between mediocre and extremely strong. Um, as I mentioned, business transactions as a as a number uh, were down uh, in 2020 than over uh, uh, 2019 by about 12 percent, and mm -hmm. that was really because of you know the effects of the pandemic in, in the in the late first quarter, second quarter. Um, it, they, there was a strong rebound at the end of the year. And so I think there's this overhang of business owners who want to sell their business. Many businesses are still owned by baby boomers who are just another year older. And, and if their businesses have um, survived the pandemic and, and maybe thrived in it, um, you're going to see a strong interest on, sure. on them selling. And, and there is still a lot of capital in, in the marketplace, I think, as you've seen uh, larger corporations maybe uh, downsize. There are a lot of executives and individuals that are looking to get out of the corporate world and looking to buy their own business. And so I think that's going to help drive the market. Uh, I also think with the change in administration, there's uh, a sentiment that perhaps not in 2021, but that in 2022, capital gains tax rates will, will rise um, under the new administration. And so I have clients that are interested in selling this year so that the, the, the way they're taxed on that transaction will be at what is expected to be a lower rate mm -hmm. than potentially next year. So I think all of those factors are going to mean that 2021 should be a pretty vibrant year to, to sell a business. And that concludes today's program. Thanks to our guest, Garrett Lawson, Managing Director for Gemini Group. Today's program is brought to you by Stringham Schools, an ambition company educating real estate professionals since 1989. Visit stringhamschools.com for more information. And don't forget to tell us what you think about the program in the comments section below. I'm Gary Barnes. I'll see you next time on Stringham Real Estate Edge.